Hi, everyone, and welcome to our virtual recording is on. There we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our virtual discussion of local author Peter Reed's Every Hill, a Burial Place. We have the author Peter here, as well as Olympian local Skip McGinty. This is our first virtual event that we're doing. So if there are some bumps, don't worry. We are mostly taking questions in the chat feature, which I'm going to go over in just a second. Uh, as a reminder, you can purchase this book through Orca Books at our website. I am going to leave a link in the chat box. And here is another one. Let's see. So Peter Reed served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tanzania at the time of the Kinsey murder trial. And this book draws on Peter's considerable legal experience that exposes inconsistencies and biases in the case. Peter is joined by Skip McGinty, who is a retired healthcare executive and consultant. He also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa and the Middle East in the 60s and 70s. So our session is going to last about 60 minutes. Skip will interview Peter for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by questions from the audience. Please, uh, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras disabled as we do this. Uh, we are recording the event, so if you don't want to appear on video, make sure to keep those cameras disabled. Um, you can do this at the bottom of your screen, also to make sure to enter your name when you're asking a question. Um, if you want to know where the chat box is, it's at the lower left. It's like a little square speech bubble. You click that and then it should pop up toward the left. Um, so Peter and Skip, I give the floor to you. Great. Thanks, uh, Jonah. Uh, Peter, what a pleasure to be able to talk to you about your very interesting book. Thanks. Glad to be here. And thank you for sharing your time with us, Skip. So uh, let's let's start with some background. Uh, you're from around here originally, aren't you, Peter? I am. I was born and raised in Aberdeen. Um, left there to go to college to Stanford when I was 18, and um, returned after I had retired from legal practice in California. Returned in, to Olympia about uh, 15 years ago. And you, uh, you made a decision to join the Peace Corps uh, right after college. Uh, how, how did that decision come about? Well, I submitted a um, uh, application to the Peace Corps probably in the spring of my senior year. And uh, I hadn't heard anything from the Peace Corps. In my application, I'd requested a posting in Asia somewhere. Uh, I'd done a great deal of studying about Asia while in college, and uh, I hadn't heard and hadn't heard, and I'd actually moved to Seattle and uh, started graduate school at the University of Washington. Um, actually, I hadn't started, but uh, had enrolled, and I got a call from the Peace Corps saying, we have a position open in Tanganyika, would you be interested in uh, joining that group? And uh, even though at that time I had no idea where Tanganyika was, I said, sure. So I signed up and then uh, hurried down to a friend's house, looked up uh, in the world book to see where Tanganyika was, and uh, went on from there. Uh, to a training program at Columbia University in New York for about three months before traveling to Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, when you got to Tanzania or Tanganyika when you first got there, was um, did you meet the Kinseys right away, Bill and Peppy Kinsey? No. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we met him. Uh, there was an American couple who lived next to us at the school where uh, I was teaching called Wiru Boys Secondary School. And the wife had been at Mount Holyoke with Pepe, although the wife was a senior when Pepe was a freshman, but they were in the same dorm at that time. So uh, they knew each other and one day they were walking um, both couples around town. The town was called Mwanza, which was about five miles from where our school was. And uh, um, 
Pepe called out the maiden name of the uh, of the wife uh, Betty Clemmer, and uh, which what she knew her as at Mount Holyoke, and Betty responded, and uh, they realized that uh, you know, they knew each other, and so the Kinseys were stationed about maybe 80 miles from Monza. So they would only come into town occasionally. And usually when they did come in, they would uh, join the Clemmers for dinner and the Clemmers often invited us to join them as well. So I probably met them, oh, maybe three or four times over a year and a half period. So you, you really didn't know them that well then? No, I didn't. Uh, certainly not good friends um, and, uh, you know, communications. It wasn't like you could pick up a cell phone or do a Zoom with people then. There were long periods between time when you simply couldn't connect with people. And that was the way things worked in Tanganyika and Tanzania at that time. And uh, you, in describing Bill and Pepe in the book, you basically use the descriptions of others. Did you did you have any impressions of your own that you'd be interested in adding? Well, mine were probably much the same uh, as you saw coming from others. Pepe was a very um, voluble, friendly, gregarious, outgoing. Uh, person. Uh, Bill was quieter, some might say more serious appearing, um, seemed friendly enough, but wasn't, I would say, as open as Pepe was. Peter, did you keep a diary or a journal as a volunteer, or did you have letters to home or to friends that you relied on at all in the, constructing the book? I didn't keep in a, a diary or a journal. Um, I did write letters home and uh, my family kept those letters. So I did have some uh, information, but mostly it was from memory and the memories then would be jogged by um, documents or when I interviewed people who would talk about various events and so forth, they. Um, would generally remind me of what had happened, how it had worked. And uh, so I relied pretty much on the documents and communications. And, you know, I, I did have a good memory, although I didn't start writing the book until, oh gosh, maybe 40 years after the incident. So I'm sure there were things that I forgot. So, th so that uh, leads to the obvious question is, why did you write this book? What, what motivated you to, to do so? When I was, uh, I was in graduate school at uh, London University at the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, sometime after I was in the Peace Corps and uh, getting a master's degree in African law. One of the professors there, Jim Reed, um, no relation, had been in Tanzania at the time of this case and had actually been on the faculty of the law school at uh, the university in Dar es Salaam. And uh, so he was aware of the case. Uh, in fact, he was consulted about potential defense attorneys for Bill uh, when they were looking around. And so when um, we were, he and I were talking one day and he mentioned that he was planning to write a book on interesting trials from the British Commonwealth. Uh, and would I be interested in writing the story about the Kinsey trial? I told him, sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, nothing ever came of that book, but uh, a number of years later, uh, it seemed to me that there was a book to be written about this, although I initially thought I would write a fiction, a fictional account rather than uh, a true account. 
but then I was able to get uh, extensive files from the Peace Corps and talk to several of the people who had been involved. And it became clear to me that um, there was ample evidence to write a nonfiction account. So I changed my focus and began accumulating additional materials, talking to people, hearing referrals to other people to talk to and other sources of material. And uh, so that was kind of the process that went on. Did you, were you, I think you, were you thinking about a career in the law when you were a volunteer? I, I know you mentioned you attended much of the trial. Was that, was your perspective partially from somebody who was thinking about being a lawyer? I did start thinking about that when I was in Tanzania. I hadn't really thought much about it prior to that. Uh, um, when I was enrolling in graduate school at the University of Washington, it was uh, in education school. Uh, but during the time in Tanzania, the uh, OEO became, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity became very prominent, and they developed a legal service program for low-income people. And that really uh, appealed to me. So I started looking around for law school, and uh, I actually wound up taking the law school admission test in Tanzania. Uh, the regional uh, director for the Peace Corps basically proctored me at his house and uh, the LSAT people sent him all the materials and how to go about it. And so I took the, the exam there and applied to law school uh, while I was there. Um, and uh, the, uh, I was able to arrange actually, so my Peace Corps time finished in December of 1966. And um, I was interested in starting law school immediately. And at that time, there were a couple of law schools who had mid-year entering classes, and NYU was one of them. Um, so I applied and uh, was accepted at NYU, and so started basically in January of 1967, shortly after I returned, um, which was also a very happy event because the class had only about 30 people in for the first term. Normally a law school entering class would have perhaps 300. And so we had a very intimate class. We then continued and um, uh, went to summer school two years and wound up graduating with the class that had started in the fall before I did. I see. Um, in the book, you mentioned that a few of the volunteers in the area thought that Bill was guilty, that he had, that he had killed Pebby. Did you have an impression one way or another at the time? I didn't. Um, there was certainly um, a great deal of um, damning testimony. At the same time, there was certainly holes in that in terms of uh, any kind of motive. Um, there was a, many problems with the uh, case as it was brought. So I, I really remained essentially neutral in terms of a decision of yes or no. And now you obviously have done a huge amount of research. You may you may know more than any living person except Bill what actually happened. What uh, do you have an impression now? Well, I think I should let people uh, read the book and make their own decision. I don't want to uh, interfere with that opportunity. I think the book is styled in a way that. Uh, leads you through everything that happened and gives you the opportunity to come to a conclusion. And I think I should leave it there. Um, well, I won't be as disciplined. I, I, when I um, 
when I came to the end of the book and I read about Judge Platt's description of the case, his summary of the case, um, I was I was pretty surprised that he said this is a very close case. You know, I thought it was very possible that um, Bill could have killed her, but the the level of proof in a court case, the be, uh, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt proof, seemed like that wasn't possible to me. Uh, and I, I'm kind of I'm hearing you kind of agree, perhaps, with Judge Platt that it was a close case. Well. Um... Yeah, uh, you know, as the, for people who haven't read the book, some of this won't perhaps make sense, but in the Tanzanian system, there is not a jury, but there are assessors. Uh, in this case, there were two assessors, they call them. Uh, they serve somewhat like a juror, and they came in with, an opinion that it was clearly an accident and uh, they were certain in that. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think what Judge Platt was also looking at was had the investigation and the prosecution presented a stronger case that there was a more uh, more likelihood that it would have been found guilty. And I think he felt well, while he was finding not guilty, that it was important to indicate that uh, there were substantial issues here and uh, it wasn't uh, something that shouldn't have been brought. Do you think that there were political considerations that colored his perspective at all? The, the fact that he was a British judge working in an African country, a newly independent African country that's just very recently thrown off its cloak of colonialism? Yeah, I, I would certainly think it was at least in in the back of his mind. And I don't know whether he had any instructions from the Tanzanian government. Um, one of the failings, I think, of the book is that I was never able to track down any of the Tanzanians to interview. So the book is based on uh, Peace Corps people and files and letters and so forth. But the prosecutor, the attorney general, uh, the police chief, uh, investigator, they were not available to me. So um, there may, you know, this, this was a very difficult political situation for Tanzania. Tanzania had only been independent for a few years. They were struggling to demonstrate that they knew how to run a country and uh, do it in, a, in, in the right way. Um, and I quote in the book uh, an article by uh, a journalist in New York um, who did a nice job of writing about the case contemporaneously and, and uh, who ended her piece saying, um, you know, Bill may not be satisfied and Pepe's family might not be satisfied, but no one could say Tanzania didn't provide an excellent judicial proceeding. Um, so they did that at the same time. I think the, they were nervous about what would happen. There were comments about whether the U.S. would send in the Marines and take Bill. Um, there were issues about um, uh, foreign aid that might be stopped to a country that was desperately poor. So I don't know if there is any particular political influence applied anywhere. And I would doubt that Judge Platt would have responded to that in a, in a positive way, given his background and experience. But there might have been some 
some thoughts that we really need to get over this, get it, get beyond this case and get on with the rest of our nation building. Peter, if, if this event had happened a couple of weeks ago in Thurston County, same, same event, same, same um, evidence, same witnesses, same circumstances, do you think Bill would have been charged? Well, um, I mean, looking at it in the beginning, you had several eyewitnesses who said, this is what happened, that we saw him beating Pepe uh, with a rod or um, some kind of tool. And um, there wasn't, and there, there was blood everywhere. Um, so I would think, you know, probably one of the differences I think would be a prosecutor here would have spent quite a bit more time um, questioning witnesses and really probing you know, where they were, what they saw, the kind of thing that the uh, cross-examination produced. But at the beginning, that, that wasn't available and it might not be available easily even in Thurston County. So, uh, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised that um, that somebody in this situation would be indicted and uh, it might go to trial here. Uh, the difference here would be, you know, whether whether the defendant had was able to get reasonable representation. Um, most likely it would be a public defender. The public defender offices generally are quite good, but they're also very heavily overworked and they don't have the time or the funds to do the kind of deep analysis and um, preparation work often. So um, that would be a factor as well and whether it might be brought. Uh, Peter, did your students or your fellow teachers, especially the Tanzanian teachers, talk about the case? As far as I remember, there was almost no discussion about it. Uh, the only the only place where I heard discussion among local people was uh, Betty Clemmer, the uh, wife who had gone to Mount Holyoke and lived next to us, was teaching at a girls' school um, uh, near town, and she said that her students, some of who had come from Maswa, the town where Pepe died, uh, had reported things about the case and that uh, uh, people had moved some of the objects around and um, there were problems with the evidence and so forth, and, and uh, they told her uh, as a teacher but I heard, you know, we had uh, in, the, in the faculty common room at our school, there were you know, lots of discussions about almost everything in the world. But this really never came up. One issue may have been that it was primarily covered in the English language press, not in the native press. And the English language press tended to be read by English or Americans or other Europeans rather than um, Tanzanians. And so they, they probably saw very little of this. Um, you know, there wasn't anything in the Swahili press, as far as I know. There wasn't, there were not radio reports. Uh, there weren't other ways to find out about it. I know after you completed the manuscript, uh, you you were able to get in touch with Bill Kinsey. Can you share with us any of the conversation or reaction you had with him? Well, I can a little bit, although maybe I, I might go a little bit further back. So um, 
Um, I knew Bill there, and I uh, met up with him again in New York after we returned from the Peace Corps and uh, before he went off to Stanford. Um, and, but when I, uh, I lost touch with him and found out much later that he had spent basically his entire professional career in Europe and Africa after he came back. Uh, but when I started the book, I felt it was important not to seek him out and get his story because I wanted to try to make it as even as I could in the sense that obviously Peppy was not around to tell her side of things. And I, I felt if I um, got in touch with Bill early and started talking about it, that the story would become much more his story. Um, and I think even, even in that situation, it still was more his side because most of the information came about his struggles and his information rather than uh, Pepe's. But uh, I was trying to keep it as, as much as I could that way. So I waited until I was uh, close to the end of writing several uh, uh, versions away before trying to track him down. And it, it was not easy to track him. It took me quite some time, uh, even with internet access and so forth. But I finally did track him. Um, I asked him if he'd be willing to read the manuscript, and he said he would. Although it took me probably another six months to a year to actually have him read it and then um, be able to talk to him about it. And uh, in the end, he decided he didn't want to comment or give his view of anything on the case. So um, I did communicate. All the communications were by email. I never talked to him. Mm. Um, but that's, that's where it ended up. So I don't have an acknowledgement of somebody many you, you don't uh, acknowledge him at the end or say how much you got from him because I really didn't. Uh, one of the implicit themes in the book is that uh, Pebby may have gotten uh, short shrift in terms of getting justice for this. And I guess part of that is is explainable by the lack of sensitivity that we that's current about crimes of violence against women. But it also seems that a lot of it may have been due to the fact that it was in nobody's interest for this to have been a murder, that from the point of view of the Tanzanian government or the Peace Corps or the American government or Pebby's family or their friends, that it would seem that almost everybody would want it to be an accident, not murder. Do, do, you, do you agree with that or not? Well, I think the, the prosecution and the uh, investigating officer felt that uh, they had a good case and, and, they, and they could win. Uh, and I think they were, they were at a level that it, those kind of issues wouldn't have mattered so much to them. The Tanzanian government, for example, Mark Bomani, who was the attorney general, um, and the head of the criminal investigation department for the state, I would think they would certainly have that. Although countervailing to that, as they're trying to show uh, that they are an effective government and running a proper country, they were probably reluctant to go too far because they want, would want to show that this was a real trial and, uh, and it operated properly. So I think the issue about Pepe's um, if short shrift is, is the right term, 
is is a complex one in most situations um, where you don't have uh, where the victim is dead the victim can't testify can't tell the story uh, it's up to the prosecution then to find a way to present this and even in the best of circumstances, I think the prosecution there was very limited in their ability to do it. Um, you know, I compare it with the O.J. Simpson trial in the book where you had the dream team defense and the Los Angeles district attorney and there the district attorney is um, very capable, had lots of support from the police and the investigations and so forth. And uh, and yet, uh, in the end, uh, O.J. was found innocent. People have many different theories on why and whether it was appropriate. But um, so y y you would kind of like to have some other um, ombudsperson or something who might take up a situation like Pepe's. I mean, part of the problem for the for the prosecution was they had so little understanding of American slash European ways of dealing with things. So thinking about um, finding other Peace Corps volunteers, we might have different opinion, and uh, the Peace Corps itself could have could have come up with those and perhaps offered them to the prosecution, but they didn't. Um, and uh, the, the strange thing, I think, when the American couple, Peace Corps couple who lived near Pepe and Bill and had got to know them pretty well, tried to intervene in the trial and uh, present evidence about uh, the conflict between Bill and Pepe, they went to the prosecutor and he said, uh, oh, you're, you're too late. Uh, there's nothing we can do. Um, and it wasn't that late in the trial when that happened, about halfway through, and it seemed like it could have, it could have had a very powerful impact. Um, so my question on that was, was the prosecutor urged not to take a more aggressive line and, and bring in that kind of uh, evidence? Well, Peter, you and I have been uh, chatting about 30 minutes now. Let's open it up to questions uh, from other folks on the call now. Jonah, we have we have maybe a dozen people on the call. Would it be okay if people just use the raise their hand function and gave their question? Or do you want well, to? They can. Um, what we were thinking is you all can put your questions in the chat box. All right. Um, so... Let me see if I can turn my camera around. There aren't any questions in there yet. Well, um, if someone would like to raise their hand, they're welcome to do that. There's also the option to do in the chat box lower left. It's like a little bubble thing. Um, either way, um, if you want to raise your hand to ask a question, you will have to uh, undo your camera and your uh, microphone at the same, uh, at the very bottom. But yeah. And also click on the white hand at the bottom to raise your yes. hand. So, uh, Peter, I, I know several people that have read the book and, um, there's been, a, it's been one of the things that's been interesting to me is the variety of different reactions as people have read the book. Some people thought he was guilty at the beginning and then changed their mind as they went on and some vice versa. Have you gotten a similar reaction to that as you've spoken to people? I have. Um, in fact, not, not just people who um, became aware of the issue for the first time by reading the book, but who were in the Peace Corps at the time in Africa. And I've heard from uh, at least one of them who said uh, he was convinced all the time since uh, Pepe died that 
Bill was guilty and uh, read the book and decided that he was innocent. And another um, colleague who was in the Peace Corps in Tanzania and knew about it said he was convinced that Bill was innocent in the beginning, but read the book and was sure that he was guilty. So I'm not sure what that says about the, the book and the conclusion, but uh, you can make your own decision on it, obviously, and people do do vary, and that's part of why uh, I'm reluctant to give any specific opinion. Uh -huh. Well, we have... Like, go oh, ahead. Sorry, it looks like we have two questions if... Um, Oh, we have three now. Are you guys ready? We are. Okay, from Bill Savage. Please describe what type of law you practiced back here in the US. Uh, I uh, worked for in legal services for low income people in California for about 30 years. Um, and uh, that is a civil side. It's not the public defender. Um, so we handled um, uh, landlord-tenant problems, e evictions, and government benefit programs where poor people weren't getting their benefits, uh, family law, divorces, and so forth. And uh, at the as at the end of that, I uh, was asked to by Stanford Law School to establish a law school clinic. Um, in East Palo Alto, which is a low-income area near the law school, and uh, did that for about uh, four or five years, and then retired. Okay. Um, Ada Reed Watson asks, in all the research you did, was there something that was the most interesting or the most surprising that you learned about the way the law or courts work differently than the U.S. courts? Well, uh, by and large, the the court practice there was very similar to American because it was based on the British system, and the American system is also based on the British system, although with uh, a fair number of differences that have developed over the years. Um, probably the the most significant difference was this use of two assessors rather than um, a jury for the case. And that has that is an interesting background because um, in the 1920s, Tanganyika became a protectorate of Britain under the League of Nations. And um, so that, at that time, the English brought in their system, but that was primarily for expatriates living in the country from Britain or other parts of Europe. And at the same time, there was a parallel law called customary law, which historically had been developed by uh, the natives of Tanzania. And um, that they continued parallel. There was also Muslim law because there was a large Islamic population in Tanzania. So those operated in parallel to about the 50s, and they were, then they were merged. And so at the time of this trial, there was a combination. And the assessors, uh, the way they were generally thought was, were it a Tanzanian uh, involved, they would come from the tribe of the person accused, and they would then understand the... Um, customs of the people in that tribe and be able to bring that sense into the into the uh, case. Um, they weren't meant to be experts on customary law, but just give the flavor of that history. And the two uh, assessors here, one was a Tanzanian who had recently returned from studying in the United States. So he had both Tanzanian experience and American experience. The other was an American who had been working in Tanzania for a while. 
And so he also had American and then some Tanzanian experience. So they, there was an effort to kind of make it fit into that mold. Um, so those, those were the main um, things that I saw in terms of the differences between the systems. Let's see. Cindy Hugh asks, this trial occurred with a country, with a country that was young. Have their laws and or culture changed towards violence towards women or a husband's authority? Uh, since that time, uh, I'm not very familiar with the current practice. Um, so I don't, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on how the laws have changed and I haven't really looked carefully at them. I would expect that like many countries around the world, that the issue of domestic violence um, and uh, issues around the role of women has changed and improved some. Um, exactly what that consists of, um, I couldn't really say. Um, let's see, Judy McGinty says, I wondered about the title of the book. You noted it was an African proverb. Were hills considered sacred places? Can you explain the proverb? And were the volunteers told anything particular about hiking on the hills? Well, the, well starting at the end, uh, the volunteers, I'm sure, were not told anything about hiking on the hills. That, uh, uh, the phrase is used around East Africa uh, although it primarily comes from Rwanda and Burundi. And those countries are very um, mountainous is too um, high a term, but lots of large hills. And so um, almost everything that goes on in the country somehow revolves around being in the hills. Uh, Tanzania has Mount Kilimanjaro, which is an enormous mountain, one of the tallest in the world. And it has all these kopis, which is where Pepe died. And these kopis are made up of giant rocks piled on each other. And so they become somewhat like a hill. Um, so I think it is more... Um, deriving from people living uh, among these hills and that uh, particularly on the Kopis, there are, they tend to be inhabited by uh, wild animals as well, lions and uh, um, other uh, uh, cheetahs, leopards, and so forth. And so there's always a danger um, when you're on these hills. And uh, I think generally the sense is people have often died while um, doing whatever they wanted to do on the hills. Um, so that's, that's my understanding of the proverb. And I have to say it's not a, not a perfect understanding for sure. All right. Um... Uh, Peter, uh... You know, as a former Peace Corps staff person, I was pretty impressed with the job generally that the Peace Corps staff, both in Tanzania and Washington, did. I'm wondering about what the volunteers at the time thought. Were uh, what, what did they think about the, the way the Peace Corps director and the area director and the physician handled the aspects of this case? Well... By and large, they wouldn't have known much about it. Um, you may see in the book, I quote from several letters that Paul Sack, uh, the Peace Corps country director, wrote to volunteers describing the case and what was happening and bringing them up to date. And just about every volunteer I've asked about that, they've all said, I never got that letter. I don't know anything about it. I never heard that. So part of this, I think, is, you know, 
people perhaps don't read much from the uh, the bureaucracy. You know, something comes in the mail and uh, uh, it's discarded pretty quickly. And uh, so it seemed like very, very few volunteers had much a sense of it other than those who were stationed near where Pepe was or ones who were part of Bill and Pepe's group. Um, they had, I think, maybe 60 total in their particular Peace Corps group that came to teach in middle schools. So that group probably heard, you know, by word of mouth, whatever about it, and other volunteers who were nearby. And there were several in Mwanza where I was, um, certainly were aware of it. But um, I, I don't... Uh, I haven't heard anybody ever say, gee, I thought the Peace Corps did a great job or they didn't do a great job in the, in the case. There were complaints that they, f some felt, particularly ones who were stationed near Pepe and Bill, that uh, the Peace Corps had um, not done a very good job of uh, presenting Pepe's side in the case. Uh, so they felt that the Peace Corps officials were biased uh, in favor of Bill. Um, but even that was, you know, not a very loud complaint that I ever heard. You, you mentioned in the book that Peace Corps was uh, <clears throat> trying at least publicly to remain neutral in this and provide support at the same time for Bill. Do, do you think they straddled that line reasonably well? Well, uh, trying to look at it objectively, uh, if they were trying to really be neutral, I don't think they were successful. Um, there was a lot of effort put into uh, finding evidence to um, support Bill's position. Uh, Tom McHugh, the Peace Corps director, uh, Peace Corps physician, uh, spent a lot of time analyzing the prosecution and pointing out holes in their medical uh, evidence. Um, the Peace Corps never did uh, explore whether there were volunteers who had uh, unfavorable things to say and, and make them available. So the public presentation was neutrality, but I think underneath uh, it was not what you would call neutral. Is is Paul Sack, the country director, still living? Uh, he is. Uh, he's uh, maybe 93 or 94. And uh, in fact, I'm doing a Zoom session with a, another group of Peace Corps volunteers this coming Friday. And he plans to be part of that discussion. And uh, as you can see, he was very helpful to me in terms of uh, information about the case and his experience and what he knew and didn't know. And um, so he, he, he played a great role in helping me uh, get, get to the book and get it done. Have you spoken to him since the book has come out? Or will Friday be the first time? Uh, I haven't spoken to him, but... Uh, We've had um, email exchanges. He actually bought 75 copies himself and uh, gave them out to um, uh, Peace Corps officials who were in Tanzania at the time and uh, some of the volunteers who will be on the call on Friday. Uh, they were a group that he was particularly friendly with. And um, he said, you know, he, he really liked the book. Um, Although, you know, to the extent I'm pointing out that they, you know, they weren't very neutral a lot of the time, it's not totally favorable to him. Um, but I, I think he understands that and the importance of telling, telling the truth. Uh, one thing uh, looks like we're getting near the the end yeah. of our time, I guess. Um, one one point I wanted to make, uh, if I might, was the complex nature of dealing with this. 
uh, language, different languages uh, where uh, evidence had to be translated back and forth. Uh, that was a tremendous obstacle, I think, to really getting a, a certainty in the case. And towards that, towards that end, I, I, I would mention a, in, in the case I mentioned, um, there were a couple of U.S. Um, uh, government, uh, State Department officials on Zanzibar who were um, kicked out of the country, basically, uh, because Tanzania was uh, listening in on their telephone conversations. And uh, the Tanzanians heard things that they thought suggested they were supporting a rebellion in the country. And what the officials, what the State Department people had actually said was, uh, we're going to need some more am ammunition to uh, get our position accepted. So they were using ammunition in a uh, jocular way, but that was taken by people listening in as suggesting they were supporting a revolution. So you can see not only the different you, having to use several different languages, Swahili, Sukuma, English, but even where you're speaking the same language, it can lead to confusion, conflict, and consternation. And I, I uh, think anybody who's been in the State Department or uh, people who've been uh, officials in the Peace Corps, like Skip and others, um, I'm sure ran into similar situations uh, language is hard to uh, hard to carry forward so i don't know do we have any other any other questions or there is one last one, one has come question? in uh judy asks again if bill had been found guilty what would the likely outcome have been under tanzanian law under tanzanian law uh, he would have been executed however the president um, could commute the sentence. And um, I do mention in the book that uh, according to uh, Bill's attorney, he said that uh, the president um, had made an observation early on in the situation that um, something to the effect, uh, if he's found guilty, the law will take its course and he will be hung. So whether he would have been, uh, had the sentence commuted, um, hard to say. And what the U.S. might have done, if that were the case at this point, whether they would have invaded, which they have done in other countries, uh, is also a question on what the outcome would have been in the end. Okay, well, it seems we are at our end. I want to thank um, both Peter and Skip for joining us today, tonight for this great conversation. Um, if you want to order the book, again, the link is in the chat. I will post it one more time just for fun. Uh, you can also get it at orcabooks.com. And we will have a couple um, physical copies in the store in the next week or so. Uh, thank you, Peter and Skip. This was great. Let me add my thanks to you, Jonah, and to Orca Books for hosting this. Uh, I know this is, if not the first time, pretty early in the experience. And it seems to <laughs> run pretty well. Uh, yeah. Perhaps if people who are on this would like to send in any comments or suggestions, you probably welcome them. Um, but, uh, and I appreciate all the people who joined in tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, Skip, you're on mute. You're still so it on looks mute. Looks like we're done, huh? <laughs> looks like we're done. <laughs> Time to All go. Right. Thank you, guys. Good night. Bye.